Um, first, Dr. Lee. I'm going to read all the questions at once, though. Um, uh, Dr. Lee, um, what is angiogenesis? How many diseases have a similar cause? Explain what you mean when you say cancer tumors try to create blood supplies to feed themselves. How can we starve a cancer tumor? Should we stop eating all sugars, all cooked food, all fat? Should we eat just green vegetables, sprouts, raw seeds, and raw nuts? Um, uh, should we eat green? Yeah, that's the question. Okay, so that's your question. Dr. Campbell, your question is, you just published a paper where, wherein you hypothesize a beneficial effect of plant-based food consumption on COVID-19, not just by increasing comorbidities, but by directly increasing immunity to the virus. Can you explain this? Dr. Esselstyn, you have said, you're famous for saying that we can make ourselves heart attack proof. What is the basis for you making this claim and it hasn't been substantiated over the last 15 years since you originally made that claim. Dr. Baxter Montgomery, do you recommend bariatric surgery for people who come to you and say, I think I need bariatric surgery? If you could each answer your questions, that would be great. I guess we can go in reverse order. I guess we can go in order, go ahead. <laughs> oh no, please, the reverse order is great. <laughs> okay. You know, um, that's an interesting question, and I get that question uh, quite often. So the question is, do I recommend bariatric surgery? You know, I do not recommend any surgery firsthand. So I like to look at any health condition or illness and take it in stages. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the recommendation depends on the acuity of the problem and, and the urgency of the need. So if someone is, you know, is bleeding out with the gut, then yes, they need emergency surgery. If someone has a cardiac arrest uh, in my office, I presented a case of that earlier today, uh, they need CPR. I'm not gonna vacillate on which green juice to give them or which you know, green vegetable. They need surgery, they need these things urgently. But, but uh, given that question in the setting where the patient is clinically stable, then I step back and I go in an order of, of therapeutic intervention. And first and foremost, uh, we use a, a, a lifestyle platform and, and at the core of that lifestyle intervention is going to be the food. So we use our pharmaceutical intervention first and foremost. So whether the patient is, is, is you know, 20 pounds overweight or 500 pounds overweight or 1,000 pounds overweight, uh, and there may be some indication of bariatric surgery in, in some of those patients with those extreme uh, uh, levels of obesity. But I will start off with any patient with the recommendation of nutrition. I want to emphasize that, and here's why. The disease state is not obesity. So let's say I'm seeing a patient that's 1,000 pounds, uh, and uh, they come in and says, well, Dr. Montgomery, I'm 1,000 pounds, uh, and uh, you know, I really need to do something about my health, and so uh, you know, I need bariatric surgery. Uh, well, they don't have a disease of obesity. It's not obesity, not a morbid obesity. They have a disease that's related to the liking of bad foods that start off with their desires for bad food. And so my cure for the patient, whether it's heart disease or diabetes or cancer, whatever, I'm not trying to cure heart disease, diabetes, cancer. I'm trying to cure their desire for bad food, first and foremost, because that's the core of their disease. Because it doesn't matter what surgery I do, what pills I prescribe or whatever, if they maintain that desire for bad food, I can turn their stomach, you know, that small, but they'll figure out how to get that bad food in their system and determine the stomach will, will enlarge. So it's the issue of whether or not I would, but prescribed bariatric surgery has more to do with at what point do I prescribe bariatric surgery as opposed to whether I prescribe it or not. So my first approach is to get them on a lifestyle that's an optimal lifestyle. And yes, they may need bariatric surgery at some point. If I have to uh, surgically clear them, then they're going to be in better shape to undergo and tolerate bariatric surgery if they're on an optimal nutritional regimen than if not. I was once called to see a patient it wasn't before bariatric surgery. It was after bariatric surgery that was aborted early because she arrested on the table. And so she was in the ICU and they asked me to go and see the patient. She had a cardiac arrest while undergoing an attempted bariatric surgery. And so as it turned out, she had an ejection fraction of 10%. And so she had severe heart disease. So many people with obesity have many chronic illnesses because the illness isn't just obesity, it's 
excess inflammation, excess toxicity, stress, and a poor microbiome that's creating an abnormal milieu, and that needs to be fixed first and foremost. So whether she needs bariatric surgery or needs a toenails clip is not relevant at the outset of treatment. What's relevant is to get them in metabolic condition, and so then we see how well they do. If they're 500 pounds overweight and lose 500 pounds on a nutritional regimen, guess what? I don't recommend bariatric surgery. But if they're 500 pounds overweight, they nutritionally detox themselves, and they do better to improve their overall well-being, they may be a candidate for bariatric surgery if that is needed and thought to be beneficial to improve more weight, to, to uh, enhance more weight loss uh, and the like. Thank you. Anyone who likes. Did you, Steve, did you have an order in mind? Uh, whatever order you like, whatever you, whatever feels moved to speak next. <laughs> well, let me take a crack at this question that you put to me about COVID-19. I'm glad, um, incidentally, Steve, you used the word hypothesis. I hypothesized. You know, that, that gives us leeway to talk about things, if you will. And we, because as you know, in, in science, we can hypothesize anything we want. We can hypothesize the moon is made out of cheese. But, you know, so the hypothesis gives us leeway to think out loud without necessarily, you know, convey a conclusion, obviously. Um, so I, I just want to make that point because in the case concerning COVID-19, the data that we got, it's sort of multifaceted in a way, but that the, the information we had, which was acquired more than 30 years ago, I should add, really was on hepatitis B virus, okay? It was a human study, and what we found when we compared animal protein intake, as a reflection of animal foods, if you will, it's not necessarily just protein, but in any case, uh, people consuming uh, more animal food, and I said very, very little, uh, that was highly correlated with the production of liver cancer. I mean, I'm talking about probability 0.01, for example, uh, and reflecting you know, different, different ways of measuring that. At the same time, that amount of animal protein repressed inversely, highly significant, the prevalence of antibody. Okay, so we saw that with the animal protein, both, both the presence, prevalence of antigen and the prevalence of antibody. Then in turn, when you looked at plants and you looked at different different uh, uh, if you will, uh, characteristics of plants, whether it's not their fiber or thyme or whatever, it, it was just a reflection of plant intake. When we did it that way, it was exactly the opposite. Again, significant at the 0.001 level. More plants, uh, uh, basically no antigen and a very high level prevalence of antibody. Okay, so that's the, that's the HPV story. That in turn is supported by uh, experimental animal data we did at the time uh, on mice, transgenic mice who, were, who basically were transfected with a hepatitis B virus gene, if you will. Uh, in that setting, all the animals in that particular colony, it was created by a colleague of mine in, in uh, UCLA, actually. But in any case, uh, we, we got a colony of uh, mice ourselves. And uh, they were transfected. All of them get the liver cancer or hepatocellular carcinoma, if you will. When you're fed different levels of protein, as we increased animal protein, it had to go above the protein that was actually required by the animal for normal, for normal health. As soon as it went, it over, went over that threshold, that's when the cancer grew. When the animal protein was uh, very, very low, the liver cancer did not grow, just like what we saw in the, uh, in the human setting which I found very, very exciting. And then we went on still in other studies. In those days, natural killer cells had just been first discovered. So we, I had a colleague uh, working in that particular area. And so we had a look to see what uh, happened with the animals consuming more protein uh, in terms of natural killer cells. It was dramatic. The, the animal protein consumption decreased the uh, natural killer cells. Uh, so. And then, of course, you can go to the plant story. So I, what I'm saying, I'm hypothesizing, is that this might work. Like you say, it's used it, we use it properly, you know, in COVID-19. So in that case, I started looking at some of the WHO data for different countries for the COVID-19 of the, of the present day. And when you look at uh, countries like Vietnam, Thailand, uh, even, even Pakistan, uh, and even, let's say, in this very uh, difficult 
uh, slum area of, uh, of Bombay and in India, the, the level of COVID cases in that case and deaths, especially deaths, uh, and I try to rely on you know rates and not just total, amount, total quantity, which the media seems to like and confuse. But in any case, uh, when we look at those countries, the level of, of uh, deaths is only a fraction, 1% or less in some of those countries. In a situation where otherwise you would expect, with, especially with the slum area of uh, Mumbai and in, the, in, the, in the India, uh, you would expect that the conditions for uh, contagiousness and spread of the disease would really be bad, but it's not. In those cases, and especially in that slum area of India, none of them eat animal, any animal food, quite frankly. They can't afford it, for one thing. I've been in those areas. Uh, and of course, they have a religious prohibition against it. So it's a setting where all the other constellations of, of effects that, that exist, environmental effects exist, to actually pre, you know, suspect a very high level of COVID-19. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. So I, I'm taking my data from the experimental animal data and from the human data on HPV, on HPV, and I'm basically hypothesizing. I actually believe there's a, a good probability that uh, this could work on COVID-19 as well. In fact, we got a study undergoing on, on one of my colleagues that's working with us, is uh, right, organizing a study on that right now. I, I, so accessing as large a number of people who are consuming this kind of diet just to see if they've experienced the, the, uh, the disease first, and secondly, if they did, you know, what were the symptoms? I'm very excited to look to see that, but I'm, I'm, I don't want to, I want to be very careful about this because as we all know, this is a very sensitive topic. And uh, so what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, just because it's so sensitive, that doesn't mean we have to shut up and not say anything. I'm, I'm speaking out. This is a hypothesis, a possibility, and we already know that, you know, a, a plant-based diet is pretty effective in creating uh, immunity, innate immunity, if you will. It's continuous, too. You get on this kind of diet, stay with it. You don't have to worry about, you know, coming, coming and going as to whether or not. So that's my, that's my story, basically. I, I just uh, I'm excited about the possibility, about the possibility that we may, really may have something here. It's an opportunity. And, and it turns out this, this uh, formula to a strategy, protocol, whatever you want to call it, it's the same thing where you guys are using for heart disease and others are using for diabetes and everything else. It's no different. One, one more last thing. Uh, it come back to, I think Dr. Lee said this here before. Uh, I've always busied myself with thinking about mechanisms, being in a biochemistry area, you know, trying to understand the relationship between cause and effect, let's say in these complex, complicated situations. One of the things I've gotten really excited about, uh, namely, I started to spend some years uh, looking for the mechanism responsible for the effect of animal protein on the formation of hepatocellular carcinoma initiated by a, by a carcinogen. I found a mechanism. First thing you know, we found another one. We found another one. I kept on going. Every time we looked for a mechanism, we found one. In some cases, it was repressing DNA repair. That was really sharp. Animal protein represses DNA repair. Animal protein represses, I said before, natural killer cell activity. On the other hand, it enhances things like hormones that actually stimulate cancer growth. When I look at that, I, I just finally arrived at a point there's no such thing as a mechanism. It's kind of dangerous to end up just talking about one thing. And I, I just find that concept uh, very, very exciting because if we're consuming the right diet or something about this thing, it all works together. When you're consuming plants, it works to a very broad effect. And I'm not surprised, I would not be, I should say, I would not be surprised if we might actually see a really pretty good effect on COVID-19 patients. And as, as many of you know, this diet, when people switch to it, uh, we see results pretty darn fast. As uh, Dr. Esselton, of course, and others have shown, you know, when you put people in with heart disease, cholesterol drops like a rock. You, you guys know that, of course, better than I. It drops like a rock in a hurry. D Dr. Campbell, did you mentioned, um, I want to know that you, you alluded to some population studies where in population where uh, people eat less animal protein, there's lower coronavirus. Is that, did you publish that uh, recently? I think there was a paper. Yes, I did. 
I published that. It was published in uh, AC Nutrition. And it has that population data in it, right? Yes, it has the population data. Wow, okay. Things, like you said, it's there. I just published about, I don't know, three weeks ago. Can you share the link with me, please, on my email? Yeah. That um, publication, yeah. when you get a chance. I mean, we can, you can do it later, I guess, but I'd, I'd like to look at that. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I don't, I, I'd like to get some comments from, from uh, my, my other colleagues. Say you've been back here as well. Uh, tell me where I've gone off the rails because I'm, I'm sensitive. No, no you're I'm, not. We, we, we see that in our patients with coronavirus and we, we've had, uh, we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of patients with coronavirus and, and I don't want to get into the details of it, but, but the long and short is simply this. Uh, I put, and I have a lot of people come into me, they, you know, they want natural treatments and the like, and we put them on a nutritional regimen. We had a heart failure patient who <laughs> was morbidly obese, et cetera. Uh, he had started a detox program. He contracted coronavirus during his detox. And it was just a mild ailment. Uh, he was ill, didn't have to go to the emergency room or hospital, as ill maybe a day and a half or two. And he got over, he was coronavirus positive. And he told me, he said, look, you know, I've had pneumonias before and virus. This is the mildest episode I've ever had in my life. And, and he was convinced that it was because of what he was eating. But we've had lots of cases uh, uh, of, of patients uh, preventing and also uh, controlling their infection very effectively with a plant-based diet. And, and it, it's, you know, we'll start them at the onset of illness. So it's like giving them a pill, if you will, put them on a raw detox on day one. And within a few days, their symptoms are resolved. I've had one patient I treated with a raw detox. I gave her some supplements. Within four hours, she was feeling better. The next day, she was back to normal. Then someone went from vomiting and passing out in the emergency room. So, we, you know, we, we see it anecdotally clinically. And I, I'd like to look at that population data that you have, because uh, that sounds very exciting. I, I haven't heard anybody talk about that. And, and uh, I would like to look at that uh, uh, that you published. And another uh, uh, option that might uh, uh, kind of reinforce what Colin is saying a bit, and that uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the fact that in 1971, 72, that, uh, that Northern, the province of Northern Karelia uh, in Finland was known as the heart attack capital of the world. And it was such an embarrassment to Finland that there was this enterprising, a courageous young physician from Helsinki who went to Karelia, uh, Pekka Puska. And, you know, here they were, uh, all these lumberjacks uh, eating a heavily animal-based diet, clotted cream on everything and everybody smoked. And he worked with community leaders and, and really uh, with the community itself really got the word out, was able to get the word out, had quite a tussle with the dairy, in, dairy industry. But over the next 30 years, the heart attack rate in Karelia dropped 85%, 85%. And this, the other figure that struck me most profoundly as they were giving up their animal-based diet in dairy, during that same period of time, they decreased their rate of cancer by 67%. Okay, thank you. So uh, let, let's wow. uh, move on to Dr. Esselstein to answer your question, which was- um, proof. Yes. Right. Now, the way I, I started out this whole business of research was when I was, when I was looking to see it uh, in the pop globally, I was trying to find out if there were certain nations where there was, had a considerably less cancers than in the United States. And, and that was certainly the fact. For instance, in Kenya, uh, breast cancer rates were 30 and 40 times less frequent. But as part of this uh, uh, global uh, research, it was qu quite striking. How could it be that these nations, many of them had uh, virtually no cardiovascular disease? If you look at rural, rural China, I mean, there was a province, I will never forget where Colin Campbell <laughs> looked at the death certificates and 250,000 death certificates, one problem, there wasn't a single patient who died of cardiovascular disease. So it was, that was really quite striking. So but looking at this in a very simplistic way, the thought would be, why don't we just try to limit patients who have serious heart disease from those foods that look like they are going to be injuring the lining of the artery, that delicate innermost lining, the endothelium. Now, what makes the endothelium so magical, and I know I'm, I, I hope I'm not treading on any of Bill Lee's feet here, but 
what makes the and why why was it that the three men that dis, uh, discovered that the uh, uh, endothelial derived relaxation sub substance was was a gas for which they received the Nobel Prize? How do you get a Nobel Prize for finding out a gas? Well, that gas had remarkable properties. It keeps all the cellular elements within our bloodstream flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. When you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, to your legs, they widen, they dilate nitric oxide. Number three, nitric oxide will protect the wall of the artery from becoming thickened, stiff or inflamed, protect us from high blood pressure, or hypertension. Number four, this is the key a safe and normal amount of nitric oxide protects us all from ever developing cardiovascular disease. So literally, everybody on the planet Earth who has cardiovascular disease, whether they're from London, Berlin, Chicago, New York, or Peoria, Illinois, if they have cardiovascular disease, it is because by now, in the previous decades, they have so sufficiently trashed, injured, compromised, and turned their endothelial system into a train wreck they no longer have enough nitric oxide to protect themselves. So my whole focus uh, really be, began to be on how we could enhance nitric oxide. And that's why I think you're, you've heard me talk a little bit from time to time about uh, green leafy vegetables, because what has become apparent is that the endothelial production of this remarkable nitric oxide seems to be age dependent. For example, you never heard of a boy or girl at age eight having a heart attack. Why? They've got nitric oxide coming out of their ears. <laughs> However, by the time they are 17 to 34, young women and men, if you look at the, the autopsy study of those women and men from that age, 17 to 34, who have died of accidents, <clears throat> homicides, and suicides, now the disease is ubiquitous. Everybody has the early found, not enough for their cardiac events yet. So is it any great surprise if you build a foundation for this disease in your late teens and early 20s that by the time you're in your 40s and 50s, we now have this tsunami of cardiovascular disease. So now the other problem is by the time you're age 50, even if you're beautifully healthy, you have now lost 50% of the endothelial production of nitric oxide that you had when you were age 25. And by the time you're 80, you now lost 70% of that endothelial produced nitric oxide. So to really try to make these patients heart attack proof, I wanna be sure that they are not having a single morsel ever again past their lips that is going to further injure their endothelial cells. So we can actually try to, as best we can, with those aging endothelial cells, see if we can't goose them and prod them a little bit. And at the same time, take advantage of the new research within the last 12 years or so that shows that mankind possesses an alternate pathway for making nitric oxide. And that's why we do the following. For anybody who has cardiovascular disease, I really, uh, <laughs> I climb on them pretty hard. Although I've been told I can be a taskmaster, I've also been told that I'm not as mean as I look. But the whole idea here is I want them to chew, not smoothies, not juicing. I want them to chew a green leafy vegetable six times a day, roughly the size of half of their fish after it. It has first been boiled in water, five and a half to six minutes, so it's nice and tender or steamed. Then they must anoint it with several drops, either of a rice vinegar or a balsamic vinegar. Why? Because research has shown us that the acetic acid from those vinegars will restore the nitric oxide synthase enzyme contained within the endothelial cell responsible for making nitric oxide. So they're gonna chew this alongside their breakfast cereal, again as a mid-morning snack, again with their lunch and sandwich, that's three, mid-afternoon, four, dinner time, five, and of course I adore it when they have that evening snack of kale. So the second benefit, when you are chewing the green leafy vegetable, it restores the capacity of your bone marrow to once again make the endothelial progenitor cell. What do they do? 
the endothelial progenitor cell will replace our senescent, injured, worn out endothelial cells. The third benefit from chewing the green leafy vegetable, the third benefit is as you are chewing that green nitrate, it is going to mix with the facultative anaerobic bacteria that reside in the crypts and grooves of your tongue. Those bacteria mixing with that green nitrate are going to reduce the nitrate to a nitrite. Now, when you swallow the nitrite, it is your own gastric acid, which is going to further reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide. So think about it for a minute. What you're doing for literally no expense, added expense, no hideous side effects, you are replacing from dawn to dusk, morning to night, all day long, you are replacing nitric oxide, the very molecule, the deficiency of which gave you this disease in the first place. Now there is a caveat. Apparently fluoride in toothpaste and fluoride in public drinking water and mouthwash will injure those beneficial bacteria. And we do not like the patients to take antacids because if you reduce your gastric acidity, you will be unable to reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide. Now, I know you've, you've probably wanted, and I will finish up by saying, I'll tell you what the green leafy vegetables are. They are bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collard, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, turnip greens, napa cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus. And the top six are kale, Swiss chard, spinach, arugula, beet greens, and beets. And that's how you get to be heart attack proof. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee, do you want me to repeat your question? No, I remember your question. Uh, I'll, I'll get to it. And uh, I want to make a maybe a couple of comments. Um, first, uh, thank you to my colleagues for their um, incisive comments. Uh, uh, Dr. Campbell, uh, interestingly, uh, in July, of last year during the pandemic, there was a report, um, kind of a preprint report looking at 900 people in China um, that hadn't gotten COVID and then followed them over the course of um, the, the, the month, ensuing months to see who got COVID. And they did some interesting things. They looked in their bloodstream to look for cytokines, including the cytokines that would have antiviral properties like interferon gamma, a natural virus killer, um, also looked at the microbiome uh, to look at um, uh, what types of bacteria were growing in their, in their poop. And they also looked at uh, their food frequency questionnaire to find out what people were eating. So in the midst of this pandemic, there was this um, study going on. I haven't seen the final, final version of it, but, I, but the, the preprint was indeed very interesting because they went into great depth. They found that the people who wound up going on to develop COVID were more deficient in interferon gamma. They didn't produce as much interferon gamma, which makes sense because it's a natural virus killer. And that was the hypothesis that was actually assigned to that group that did not develop COVID. Then they've correlated the uh, interferon gamma production with two bacteria that they found um, uh, noticeably in those people that produce uh, the interferon gamma. And one was lactobacillus and the other one was ruminococcus. So these two species of bacteria were made in the fecal matter uh, and, and, and was correlated, again, hypothesis with interferon gamma, which then was correlated with lower um, uh, uh, COVID uh, um, incidence in that group. And then they looked at the food frequency questionnaire. And what they found is that um, they found that the people that had more ruminococcus and lactobacillus had drank more tea, both green tea and black tea, as well as had more omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids from a variety of sources. And so, you know, this kind of backs up into this daisy chain of associations that generate and support the hypothesis that you are actually making with the additional sort of cytokine measurement in the blood. So this is the kind of thing that needs to be done more. Um, and it actually speaks to, you know, Dr. Montgomery's comment about the microbiome and Dr. Esselstyn's uh, comment about 
sort of, you know, how diets may actually uh, affect uh, multiple aspects of systems biology uh, that could act, you know, so that it's not simply uh, one magic bullet, but sort of different patterns of behavior that can actually make um, a, a difference as well. So that's one. And so one of the things that I'm actually doing right now is looking at in greater detail at how various dietary factors influence those um, targets with COVID or the immune response against it. And in particular, something fascinating as in this country, we're getting more, more people vaccinated is that there are dietary factors like brassica, uh, sulforaphane containing uh, uh, foods that actually uh, have been shown to improve the response of the body to vaccines. We haven't done this with the COVID vaccine yet, but this has been studied with the influenza vaccine. So there was a group of young people, young healthy people getting the flu vaccine um, in North Carolina, where they actually got an, a nasal spray of the vaccine during flu season. And they um, measured before and after in two groups, um, uh, what were their immune profile that you would expect to respond to a vaccine. And they also swabbed the nose afterwards to take a look at residual virus that may or may not be present. And the two groups were one group that actually had, I think it was two cups of broccoli sprouts. These are the three, four, three to four day old broccoli sprouts okay. and rich with sulforaphanes that were made into a smoothie or a shake. And then another group that actually basically had a, a placebo smoothie and what they found um, uh, having the shake, I think for three days, is that the T cell response to the vaccine was amplified. The natural killer T cell response to the, vac to the uh, uh, people who received the vaccine and the broccoli shake was 22 fold increased. Oh, wow. It also lowered the residual vac uh, virus that might be found in the nose in these people. And then they actually looked at their clinical outcomes because they measured which people wound up getting sick and which people wound up missing work in school, et cetera. And clearly the broccoli sprout uh, group um, actually had less flu um, symptoms as well. So again, you know, this isn't food versus medicine. This is food and medicine, just speaking to the power of, of uh, that we need to kind of decrypt in terms of our, our uh, when it comes to COVID, uh, not just for the infection, but also even for vaccination. Right, sure. So, um, so let me talk about angiogenesis. So um, angiogenesis is the growth of blood vessels in the body. It's a natural process. Um, it actually starts in the womb. The first three components of our body that develop after sperm meets egg and start to form the initial clay of the human body is our fat, our adipose tissue, amazingly, our nerves and our blood vessels. So those are the first three things that get laid down kind of like the, the, the background of the, um, of the painting uh, when, you, when the artist starts putting the colors down. Um, those blood vessels um, actually start out as little lakes of blood, blood vessels, endothelial cells, as Dr. Esselstyn was talking about. And what they do is they start essentially as a, as a blotch that then using growth factors and stem cells and other signals that are formed during development, they eventually pattern themselves into our circulation, which is what Dr. Montgomery treats and deals with us. And Dr. Esselstyn was operate, you know, talks about operating on as a surgeon. Those that beautiful blood vessel pattern that we all see in, you know, you can look on the internet for circulation. That pattern is a 60,000 mile channel in the body, and it feeds, it brings oxygen and micronutrients to every cell in our body, and the endothelial cells that Dr. Russellston actually was mentioning are play another critical role besides forming the wall of the blood vessel. They actually um, release, directly release proteins to the cells next door in the organs in which they inhabit. That's called a paracrine effect. And basically each of these endothelial cells are like a farmer that, that um, dumps fertilizer to, so that the organ in which the blood vessel is um, penetrating is actually being enriched and nourished. Now, when these blood vessels are damaged, as we've talked about already over the course of, of, of age or cigarette smoke or uh, saturated fat or you know, high uh, pro uh, animal protein diets, as we've talked about to sort of synthesize a little bit, those stem cells that live in our bone marrow that are residua from 
that formation of the embryo, because we all start as stem cells. There's some of them left, about 700 million stem cells that are still left in our bodies as, as adults. Some of them actually come out of our bone marrow, like bee, bees come out of a hive to replace damaged endothelial cells as we, as we age. And, and as we get older, we lose about 50% of those endothelial progenitor stem cells, and it's very easy to damage them. Uh, from our diet. So for example, we have a high salt diet, damages those circulating endothelial cells. We have a high di diet in high saturated fat um, in sort of the so-called Western diet. This has been studied in patients, lowers, the, it stuns actually the ability of those endothelial cells to perform. You have a hyperglycemic um, uh, diet and you have high blood sugars, um, actually stuns uh, and lowers the number of those stem cells. And if you have diabetes, which is really kind of a multifactorial problem. There's also even fewer stem cells, even in the bone marrow. And so as we've been discussing, as we get older, if we don't watch our lifestyle uh, and watch our diet, all of these factors that help to repair our normal healthy circulation become damaged. Now, the question that I was asked of me is really, well, how does that relate to cancer? Well, it turns out we, have, we pretty much, our body knows how to actually create homeostasis, a state of balance in the body. We have just the right amount of blood vessels. If we need a little more, we can actually, our body knows how to figure out how to dump some natural fertilizer, growth factors to grow a little bit more, to heal up, for example, after a wound, surgery or trauma. You have a little scab, if your scab ever fell off, you saw that bright red bubbling stuff, that's angiogenesis, blood vessel growing to heal up that wound. But after the wound is healed, basically the body mows down and makes sure there isn't any extra blood vessels that grow. Because we have extra blood vessels, we wind up actually developing problems where blood vessels can bleed in the eye for, di for diabetes, diabetic retinopathy, or macular degeneration as we get older. Those blood vessels can leak in the back of the eye. Um, uh, blood vessels can grow in the joints and autoimmune diseases like arthritis, and those can cause damage as well. But the most notorious situation in which excessive angiogenesis occurs is in cancer where microscopic tumors that would normally be unable to grow because they lack a blood supply over time they acquire the ability to produce those natural fertilizers i talked about normally used for healing so tumors have been equated to wounds that actually don't heal properly and keep releasing those fertilizers and remember I told you normally the body mows down those extra blood vessels, but tumors are able to keep pumping out the fertilizer. These are angiogenic growth factors. And I worked in, in a research lab to discover the, some of those factors. There's more than 30 of them uh, today, but when I started out, there was really only one. And those growth factors essentially uh, hijack our normal circulation. They, it's like sprinkling extra fertilizer um, so that weeds will actually grow in the weed patch and now the weeds or the blood vessels are growing extra growing towards the vessel, towards the tumor. And studies have shown that if you have an avascular microscopic cancer that's isolated from the blood supply, it can't grow larger than the tip of a ballpoint pen. And it stays there until your immune system cruises by, finds it, and takes it out. Kind of as Dr. Montgomery talked about, the special forces, the Army, Navy, Marines, you know, kind of called into play. Um, special forces that are in our immune system basically are snipers that take out these microscopic cancers. But once blood vessels grow into it, studies have actually shown that when, a, when blood vessels start touching a, a previously avascular tumor and they start feeding that tumor with, with blood and nutrients and oxygens, that tumor can grow 16,000 times in volume in just two weeks. And that's actually what we see clinically is that small microscopic cancers are white they look white, they're, they're, they're avascular, not gonna go very far, but the large ones you see in surgery when a surgical oncologist operates on a cancer patient, these are big bloody tumors. And the same blood vessels that feed the cancer allow blood vessel, cancer cells to escape into the circulation for metastases. And most cancer patients don't die of their first or primary cancer, they die of metastatic disease. So what's really interesting is this emergence of the field of anti-androgenic cancer therapies, which I've been involved with, that's cutting off the blood supply um, using medicines uh, uh, to treat cancer. It's another pillar of cancer therapy today. There's about a dozen of anti-androgenic drugs developed by biotech. 
But what, what's really fascinating is that there's a number of foods that actually also have blood vessel controlling or anti-angiogenic activity. Among them, foods, foods that, are, that we've already talked about, um, uh, soy for proteins uh, uh, from soybeans, um, uh, isoflavones, um, uh, 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 the uh, sulforaphanes from brassica, uh, 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 other substances from dark leafy greens, the uh, carotenoids from carrots, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, omega, the healthy omega-3 uh, fatty acids, um, uh, and also uh, fibrous, uh, fibrous foods like nuts or soluble fiber foods like mushrooms all contain anti-androgenic activities. And when you take a look at the epidemiological evidence, the consumption of these plant-based foods have actually been linked, tied by association to the lower risk of cancer across the board. Uh, but if you look specific cancers, you can actually find which studies that cancers have actually been studied. Now, what's interesting is that we've actually gone back to the lab to isolate the molecules extracted from the foods and test them in the same systems that drug companies use to develop anti-angiogenic drugs. And we find, for example, genistein, diadestein, equal, which is found in soy and soy metabolites, powerfully shut down tumor angiogenesis. We find that sulforaphanes powerfully shut down angiogenesis. We found that elastic acid from strawberries powerfully shut down angiogenesis. And so, again, um, while mechanisms can't, single mechanisms can't explain everything, the body's way too complex. There's sort of the wisdom of the body probably exceeds our ability to truly understand it. We're beginning to make some sense out of some of these early observations that came decades ago that Dr. Campbell's work you know, pioneered um, to give us a reason to believe, and not just a reason to believe, but a reason to act as a way of actually preventing cancer. Um, and also if you have cancer to treat your, you know, while you're being treated in the oncology clinic, because the other cancer, the question was, what do we do during, during you know, if we're actually being treated with cancer, for cancer, you know, there's, there's health care that we do for ourselves between visits to the chemo unit or to the doc, oncologist's office. And that's where we can actually consume some of these healthy uh, substances uh, as well. And a study of 700 patients collected by some of the top cancer centers, including Memorial Sloan Kettering, the Dana-Farber, MD Anderson, was presented at this big cancer conference, ASCO, the American Society for Clinical Oncology. And they found that patients with stage three colorectal cancer, uh, so stage three, it's a fairly advanced cancer, um, uh, getting treatment, so regular, whatever the treatment that the oncologist is ordering, if they had two fistfuls of tree nuts, um, such as walnuts, macadamias, pecans, that, 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 that in conjunction with treatment, there was a 50% lower risk in, in mortality. And so the outcomes were improved by actually having uh, tree nuts. So this was published. Uh, this was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. It was presented as a, you know, at a plenary at ASCO, the major cancer conference. And again, these are all pieces of the puzzle of the Sistine Chapel, which is a thousand pieces all over the place. Very difficult to put together. But I think you know, folks um, that are uh, you know on this uh, panel, you know, lots of lots of us have been picking up little pieces and trying to fit them together. And that's what angiogenesis is. That's how it relates to cancer. That's how it relates to diet. And it's how it kind of ties together some of the things we've been talking about. Dr. Lee, um, when you say that there are foods that had an anti-antigenic effect as good as the drugs, um, are you saying that, did I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, are they working as well? In other words, are you just saying they're helpful or are you, say, are you saying that um, you know, broccoli sprouts and other sprouts and anti-antiogenic foods could possibly completely replace the use of a drug in fighting cancer? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm actually saying is that as we study the benefits of food and diet and how it can influence cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer, you know, some of the biggest chronic health conditions facing our society today, and this is before COVID, I think we could probably hypothesize that um, uh, dietary approaches um, will also um, help us resist COVID as this is going to go into the future, that there is an important, food is an important tool in our toolbox. And we spend a lot of time assassinating foods be, by being bad for us. And in some cases, many cases, that's a deserved um, uh, criticism of certain foods. 
But what we're beginning to understand is that there are many foods that, you know, we know are good for us, plant-based foods, um, seafoods and, as well, that actually have reasons that actually can help amplify our body's self-defenses. So this isn't really about foods replacing medicine. This is using part of the wisdom that we've actually had to acquire to develop medicines to help us in a way understand and study how foods may be helpful as well. So this is really about having food being a useful tool in the toolbox, the same way that medicine is a useful tool in our toolbox. Dr. Lee, I, I uh, asked you this same question many months ago, but I want to just uh, ask it again to see if there's an update. I was fascinated uh, sometime early last year with the fact that the Mass General was looking at, uh, uh, for patients who came in with a diagnosis of COVID-19, that they had an, 30 minutes of inhalation of nitric oxide three times a day. And then there was a, car, a, a sort of a sister study that was done with the healthcare workers themselves where they had to inhale nitric oxide 30 minutes before the start of the day and then before they went back to work. Have we gotten any further information on that study? Yeah, I think that study is still underway, uh, S, but what's really interesting is that there was a very specific study that got published in, at, at Mass General with inhaled nitric oxide in pregnant women with COVID who were looking like they were actually heading towards a ventilator or an ICU. And they actually got inhaled nitric oxide. And the study clearly showed that the power of nitric oxide was able to um, uh, avert their decline, keep them from going to the to ICU or, or be ventilated, and to yeah. be able to rescue and get them out of the hospital. Now, what's interesting is what asking what would that nitric oxide be doing in those people? So one of the things that we actually did, we actually discovered that the damage to the endothelium, as you've discussed, um, is pretty profound in COVID, particularly when people are sicker and sicker, they've got more and more endothelial damage. And so nitric oxide being one of those repair mechanisms, um, that may actually help to explain why inhaled nitric oxide is beneficial. Number two is that many of these people with thromboses, they have blood clots with COVID, that contributes to their clinical decline. Um, and, and their need to go head towards an ICU setting. Um, nitric oxide is a wonderful vasodilator, which we know Vi Viagra and Cialis also do. And so that might actually have been able to assist them as well. I'm actually now involved with a, in a conversation of a potential future clinical trial uh, with a group that's in the UK, and they actually have um, a nitric oxide precursor that's in an inhaler. And that the, we're actually they're looking at for long COVID or post COVID, the people who have recovered and are still having shortness of breath, um, to see if actually giving that nitric oxide precursors and inhaler could actually help improve their healing uh, within their lungs. Mm -hmm.